our video played at the wrong time, but it's good to see you guys today. How y'all doing? That bad, huh? I feel you. It's been a rough week, hasn't it? I am excited, though, uh, to see you guys here with us today. It's good to see the crowds coming back in, and I really want to say that we appreciate everybody joining us through our live stream, either on Facebook Live or the Church Online platform. Uh, we are super excited, somewhat nervous and hesitant, at least myself, about uh, continuing in our Resolute series. Uh, we started off last week talking about how we can have peace in the midst of turmoil. And peace is something that I have, and I gain that through the perspective that I choose. What perspective I choose to have either on the things here in the world, or whether I choose to place that perspective on Christ. And uh, Gary and I had a good time. Where's Gary? Is Gary in here? There he is. Everybody say hey to Gary. Did y'all notice he was wearing my suit jacket in that video? Your own suit jacket, Gary. But we had a good time with it. We had a lot of fun with it. We felt that uh, everything's been so heavy lately. I mean, you guys can attest to that. Everything's been heavy. So we wanted to liven it up a little bit and just joke around some, talking about a subject that's super important, but bring it a little bit of humor and just give us a break. And then we have today's sermon. Y'all pray for me, okay? Sometimes in uh, sermons, you come up to it and you get really excited. How many of y'all do a job that you love? Raise your hand. How many of y'all do a job that you love? And you're really excited about it, right? Ross is retired, so he's like, I, I, I love my job. You know, and sometimes, though, you come up to a point in that job where you're still excited about it, but you're a little nervous about the outcome. Today's topic is grace in the midst of outrage. Our whole series is based off of Luke chapter 9, verse 51, and it says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And our question is this, can today's disciples be resolute without grace in their life? No, they can't. So what does it look like today to have grace in the midst of outrage. Because everywhere you look, there's outrage. You go to Walmart, they're outraged. You go to Target, they're outraged. You go to bed, there's outrage. There's all sorts of, it seems like everywhere you go, there's outrage everywhere and people are just attacking everybody else. So how do we get past that and what does that look like? Um, but I have a couple of disclaimers about the message before we start. Number one, today's message... Uh, Perhaps some of you and maybe even many of you will be like me and it'll hit you dead smack in the forehead. There will probably be some things that we say up here today that you're not going to like. And that's a disclaimer. I want to challenge you to stick with it and to persevere through that. We all need things that challenge us in our life. And I think today for many of us is going to be a challenge to do that. Also, if you get outraged about a message campaigning for grace in the midst of outrage, well, you're the person we're talking about today. The second disclaimer is this. There are many things that we need to be outraged for. There are terrorism acts all over the world that destroy people's lives, that destroy things that they hold dear to them. We should be outraged by that. There is human trafficking and exploitation, people that are taking advantage of others and selling them into, into different trades, into sex slavery, and things like that. We should be outraged by that. We should be outraged by the, the moral discrepancies that are going on in the world today, by the addictions and the poverty and the racism and the, the hate that is going around that destroys people's lives the issues here all deserve a response of righteous anger, but we have to guard and be careful that that righteous indignation doesn't morph into something else. And so as we go through the sermon today, I don't want you to think that I'm telling you not to stand up for what is right. I'm not telling us not to stand for what we believe, and I'm not telling us that we can't be countercultural. What I am saying is that we have to do it 
in a way that's different from the rest of the world does it. And we're going to start today with a couple different points that talks about this and kind of shows us and illuminates our path forward. Here's what we know. Number one, Christians suffer at the hand of a culture that is often outraged with us. And they can be outraged at us for a lot of different things because of what we believe, because of what we stand for, because of what other people who claim to be Christians believe and stand for and shout really loud so they think that's what we all are. They can be outraged because we pray in a public space. They can be outraged because we come to church and we sing worship songs to a God that we can't see. They can be outraged for whatever means, but oftentimes... That outrage is not logical. In September of 2019, New Orleans Saints quarterback Drew Brees uh, recorded a little video talking for uh, children's literacy. It was done by a group called Focus on the Family. And what he did is he recommended that these children bring their Bibles and read them as often as possible. And it was just his little segment that he did. And I know Drew Brees is kind of a lightning rod right now for a whole bunch of different cultural issues. So we're not saying that we agree or disagree with him. But the fact of the matter is, from that little video, what happened is, because Focus on the Family agrees with a traditional view on marriage, not 24 hours after the interview came public, he was automatically labeled uh, a hate group activist. Uh, One of the posts that I read looking back at it was saying that he was a homophobe and that he spoke for the NFL saying that they discriminated against people that were homosexual and all this stuff. And it was outrage, mass outrage all across the media. And see, what they wanted, the producers and the, the publicists and everything, they just wanted clickbait. They just wanted a catchy headline that would get folks to click on their little article, right? But the ramifications on his life and the ramifications on our lives from that outrage are far-reaching. Because things that happen don't just go away easily. People's perceptions, people's outrage, people, the way they view us can have lasting effects. Outrage overwhelms truth. It drowns out logic. It feeds on emotion, tribalism, and misdirection. The war path of a cultural battle has few off-ramps for reason and the nuance of truth. Often opponents of Christianity just want to leverage their anger at something, whatever that is, at another thing that they don't understand. But it's not something new, right? A lot of folks were surprised by this, but it's, it's not something new. In Mark 13, 13, it says, Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. You know, a lot of times as a church, we do really good like promoting like, Hey, come get saved. Jesus loves you. It's good. We have cookies. We don't really have cookies. I don't know if you guys know that. We have donuts, though. Eldon brings them. And then, but it's good, right? Everything's good. You're going to meet friends. You're going to meet family members. You're going to have all this really cool stuff. You get to see Gary all the time. And you get to meet, you know, come to covered dishes and potlucks and all that good stuff. But what they don't talk about is some of the flip side, some of the things that will happen, some of the weird looks that you'll get when you're praying in public, some of the, the conversations that will start online when you mention something biblical, some of the friendships that you will lose, but God is honest with us in Scripture when he says, hey, look, you are not like them. I didn't call you to be like them. And because of that difference, they are not going to understand you. Ephesians 6.12 says this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil In the heavenly realms. We have to keep in mind, guys, that the the people that are outraged with us, that the hate that we receive, that is not coming. They are not, the people that are giving that to us are not our enemies. This is a, a battle that's been going on since the beginning of time, and it's a battle that will go on until the end of time. And we have to understand 
that when we receive that, the people giving it to us are not our enemies. Luke 6.27 says it best. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. The news reporter that hates your values is not your enemy. The Facebook keyboard warrior that posts on everything that you say and all the little things that you do, he is not your enemy. They are not an enemy. They are image bearers of God the Creator. And we have to understand this because if we view the battles that we partake of in society as things to be won, we will inadvertently find ourselves on a crusade when we're actually on a rescue mission. This is not a battle that I can go to and beat people down. I don't win by destroying the person that hates me. I don't win by proving myself right. I win when they come to Christ. And we have to understand, I'll say it one more time, we are not on a crusade. We are on a rescue mission. Our job as Christians is to go to the people that are lost, is to go to the people that don't look like us, that don't act like us, that don't talk like us, that don't believe the same things we do, and to tell them the story of what God's grace and God's mercy has done in my life. But we get into this idea that I have to win. Somebody posts something different on Facebook. Ah, I have to beat them. There is no winning on Facebook. How many of you guys realize that? I uh, I posted this thing about Chuck Norris this weekend. It was really cool. Chuck Norris joke about five days ago. And it talked about how Chuck Norris had died to COVID, but after a minor inconvenience, right? It's this whole long passage. He came back and he kicked COVID-19. And now COVID-19 is in isolation for two weeks, right? I thought it was great. We had like 47 comments. 44 of them called me out for promoting fake news. I was like, guys, it was a joke. Like, read to the bottom of the paragraph, brother. Like, Chuck Norris, first of all, Chuck Norris can't die. I think he's going to be like Elijah and just go up to heaven, right? You know what I mean? Second of all, like, read, read the paragraph. But you can't win online. You can't win that battle. And it's not something that we're called to win. We have this idea that people are going to come to Christ when they realize how wrong they are. And that is not the case. People are going to come to Christ when they are convicted of the sins in their life and they realize that he is the solution. Which leads us to our second point. Here's what we secretly know. But we don't appreciate have I mean, point that out to us. Christians hurt others with our outrage. We ruin our witness by our lack of grace. See, Christians are every bit as proficient with outrage. In fact, I would even say we are more proficient in it because we have righteous outrage. Oh, I can't believe that happened. The Bible says, blah. Have you ever had a good conversation where somebody said, the Bible says, in that tone of voice? No. You want to beat them over the head with a stick. But we Christians, we have this idea that this righteous indignation can beat people over the head until they see things the way we do. And we go about it in the same way the world does. A general rule is if we look the same, we're doing it wrong. If we look the same, we're doing it wrong. You know who was harder on Drew Brees than anybody else? Christians. A couple days later, he was uh, uh, um, ambushed, I would say, in his locker room by this news media reporting group. And he backed down saying, hey, look, I don't condone hate of anybody, no matter what they believe or what they do. Well, Christians, we didn't want to look into it. We just wanted to say, oh, how could he? Oh, man, I read one of the articles that says Drew Brees is a chicken and backed down from his belief in the face of cultural standing. But nobody wanted to take a second and look at what was actually going on. If you looked at the comments on the posts, the Christians were the ones saying that he was going to burn in hell for what he did. The Christians were the ones who were saying that he had lost his salvation. Or I, I saw one that said, I bet you he never even was a Christian in the first place didn't matter what had actually gone on. It didn't matter 
what he had actually said. Now, could he have handled it better? Probably. Would you or I have done any better in that same situation? Most likely not. But outrage doesn't have time to think about that. Outrage doesn't have time for grace. Because nobody really wanted to hear what the other person had to say. They were looking for an outlet to vent their anger. There's a lot of anger going around right now. There are a lot of people looking for outlets for that anger. And we have to be very careful that we understand that it is not okay for us to vent our anger and conform to the way the world does it. I'm not saying we don't stand for what is right. I'm not saying that we don't talk to people about what we believe. I'm not saying any of that. What I am saying is that we need to make sure that we're doing it in a different way. We need to make sure that we're doing it in a different way. Romans 12, 12 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Ed Stetzer said it really well. He said, When outraged Christians feed media outlets with stories that Christians that make Christians look foolish, it hurts the gospel. It adds to the perception that Christians are rage, addicted, and emotionally unstable. Probably one of the biggest times that I saw this in my life was in 2015. How many of y'all remember when Starbucks removed the Christmas tree off its cups? Oh, I shouldn't mention it on the church stage, right? I was walking through Walmart in 2015 uh, shopping for my child's Christmas present, which is hard when you have a girl and you really don't understand girls. Like, I'm just looking around aimlessly, like lost. And I stopped at Starbucks and I had this red cup. And it was only red. And somebody stopped me and they said, I know you. I was like, oh, cool. I didn't remember their name. So I was like, I hope they don't know my name. But they did, right? And they said, ah, how can you do that? And I was like, what? Like, what, what, am I in the wrong aisle? Like, do I have something in my cart? Like, what, what is? They're like, you bought coffee from Starbucks. I was like, do you want some? I didn't, I didn't understand. And they went on this tirade about how Starbucks is removing Jesus from Christmas and how the, by taking off the snowflakes that there was this horrible company and blah, 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 and how we needed as Christians to make them pay. We were going to go on and just not get coffee from them ever. And I was like, so that means I won't have to wait in as long a lines, right? I just didn't understand it. They're not a Christian organization. And when did a Christmas tree become indicative of the cross? When did a a, a snowflake become indicative of baby Jesus in a manger? That is not the Christmas story. That is something that we made up. It's something that we added. And we were mad about it. But nobody wanted to step back and say, hey, look, they're not a Christian organization anyways. They just wanted to be mad about something. They spent 20 minutes in Walmart telling me how horrible I was and how how bad I was and how they were going to make Starbucks pay. Well, guess what? Starbucks didn't pay. Uh, You go to Starbucks in Kernersville, you can't get in there for two days. Right? Nobody cared. You know what it did, though? It made us look like fools because it wasn't righteous indignation. It wasn't something, a biblical truth that we needed to stand on. It was a bunch of people that wanted to be mad at something that looked exactly like the world. In Matthew 5, 7, it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. When we are embroiled in deep conflict with outrage, your witness is weak. The lost become opponents that must be defeated instead of people that we are seeking to save. And it is a backwards mindset for Christians. It is a backwards mindset. And it is so easy right now to get pulled into that, maybe more than ever in my entire life that I've ever seen. And I want to warn us against that pitfall. 
Because when this is done, when, when COVID is, is gone, or at least behind us in whatever way that looks like, when the, the rioting and the looting are finished, you know what people are going to remember? They're going to remember whether you were approaching them with grace or with hate. They're not going to remember the things you did in secret. They're not going to remember the, the people that you fed. They're not going to remember any of that. They're going to remember what you looked like during this time. What does your Facebook look like? What do your text messages look like? What do your emails look like? What do your conversations that you have with people look like? And I think if we take a moment and we really dig deep into that, the answer is startling. How easy it is to fall into those patterns. The third point is this. We have to dress ourselves not in the outfit of outrage, but in the garments of grace. Colossians 3.12 says, As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience. Clothe yourself with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, and with patience. Now, what does it mean to clothe yourself? What's the first thing somebody sees about you from a distance? It's your clothing. People look at me and they say, oh, Josh likes skinny jeans. I got news for you. Josh doesn't like skinny jeans. I was at Walmart shopping one day and Heidi brought me these pair of jeans to wear and they were skinny jeans. And I walked out and I said, baby, I don't know about these. I don't like them. And she said, oh, okay, here, try this pair. And she gave me another one. Guess what they were? They were skinny jeans. I tried them on. I said, babe, I really don't like skinny jeans. I don't, you know, try the third pair on. They were skinny jeans. She said, how do you like them? I was like, they're great. They're good. She said, great. I think you look great in them. Blah, 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 blah. I was like, well, sign me up. She thinks I look great. Like, that's all I care about. Like, hey, I'm not going to tell you what she said look great from the stage, but it's a conversation for another time, right? <laughs> you know, Sometimes on stage you say something without thinking about it, and then you realize that's going to be online forever. <laughs> Moving on. Ross, don't tell Pete. What kind of clothes do you wear as you interact with people? What would your Facebook be clothed in right now? What are your interactions? What is their purpose? What are you getting across to people and what are they seeing before you ever speak, before you ever do anything, is the first thing they think about you, wow, something's different about them. Or is it, man, every time I talk to them, I get so stressed. What are you clothed in in your life right now? Have you, you have been called and commanded by your Father to walk your life, to live out your faith in a certain way. And if we want to see an example of that, we look to Paul. Paul had a hard, hard life. The road to Damascus was a life changer for him. But I think of all of his encounters with God and Christians, that was probably the time he got off the easiest right? He went blind. He had scales in his eyes. And that was the best part. Like you look back and you say, oh yeah, I remember that time I was in the car wreck and I broke my back. That was a great day. You know what I mean? But Paul had it rough. Like his friends and his family left him. When he first started walking with Christ, nobody believed him because he'd been killing Christians. And so he didn't have any of his old friends. He didn't have any of his new family. He was by himself. He was so persecuted, he had to be lowered over a wall in a basket to be smuggled out of town. He was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was imprisoned, he was stoned, he was whipped, he, you name it. And if once he had turned his righteous anger, because you can bet those are good things to get angry about, if he had turned that against the people that he was trying to save, he would have damaged his witness. 
If we look at anybody who had any reason to be culturally mad at other people, it was Paul, and he chose not to. When he showed his indignation and his anger, he did it in a graceful way. When he called people out for what they did, he was honest, but it was loving. When we stand before others in our lives and we try to change them, we have to be a picture of what we want them to change to. Or we will fail because what's the sense in changing if they're already the same? What's the sense in worshiping a God that doesn't call for His people to act differently? Please understand that for all those insults, for all those things that Paul received, he changed the world as we know it. We may not be able to bring everyone to Christ, but like Paul, we can take Christ to everyone we meet. But that is determined, their impression of that is determined by what we are wearing at that time. Instead of outrage, try to engage others with grace and watch what happens in your life and the lives of those around you. You know, Mike shared a personal story with, uh, with me this week as we were talking about this sermon. And um, I didn't know this, but Mike, Mike Wallace, he's one of the ministers over at our Kernersville campus. Uh, his dad was in a Christian band. And they, uh, the story goes that um, the band had been playing in a lot of different places. It was a secular band, and they all got saved. And so they wanted to start playing in churches. And so his dad sat at the table, and he wrote out handwritten letters to a whole bunch of churches uh, that they knew up and down the East Coast, just looked them up. I guess back then it was in the, fo the phone book, the yellow pages, right? And he sent out these letters. And the majority of the people who responded back were pretty kind. He got a lot of gigs from it. They went and played for free because they were just looking to figure out how to do the Christian band thing. But he said the one response that they got that he will never forget was a pastor from one or two states up in a church who had sent back his original letter with two words outlined and highlighted that his dad had spelled wrong. And down at the bottom he said, I will never have you at my church because you're an uneducated Christian hick and you're doing the kingdom of God a disservice. And Mike said he remembers his dad sitting there and crying at the table at the thought doing harm to this new family that he loved. It was a big discouragement to him. We have to understand that when we come here, we're coming together as a family. And we need to hold each other accountable, but do it with love. And when our family goes out into the community, we need to tell them what our family is, who, what we stand for. But we need to make sure that when we are outraged at the things that go on, and there are a lot of things that need that outrage, but that we present that in a different way from what the world does. If your conversations are just as violent and driven by hatred as the violence that's going on in our country right now, something needs change. And that's my challenge to us today. As we go out into the community, how can we be that change? I don't want to, I don't know how many people in here, everybody picks on preacher counts, but maybe there's a hundred, maybe there's 110, maybe there's 80, whatever that is. Imagine if 80 families left here today and all we did this week was we spread the good news of Jesus Christ. When everybody else around us is going, it seems like insane. If we were the ones saying, 
hey guys, look, no matter what you're going through right now, no matter what the situation is, let me tell you about what my God did for me. Let me tell you about the changes that have happened in my life. And see what a difference it makes. If you guys will stand with me as we pray, and then we're going to sing a song of invitation. If you want to come forward and receive prayer, if you want to come forward and give your life to Christ, you're more than welcome to do that. We're also going to be back in the connection room after this. If you'd like to come and talk with us in there in a more private setting, you're more than welcome to. But join me in prayer for our church, for our our other campus over on North Main Street, for all the other churches in this area and for the communities, for really for our nation to go through difficult times. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, God, so much for this opportunity for us to come here and to learn about you, to worship you, to praise you, and to, to dedicate this week towards your service. God, thank you so much for the opportunities that you give us. And God, thank you for the topics that step on our toes a little bit. Lord, I pray that you would reach into the lives of the people that are here and the people that are watching online. You would give them courage to stand for what is right. But the grace to carry it out in a way that's different from the rest of the world. God, I thank you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Sing with us, please.